Welcome back everybody to lecture number five. So now we're coming into looking at male and female in the creation story. I will approach this theologically, but because we're talking about the physical world, we've got to touch on biology. This is where theology and biology meet. And what is interesting is that we, uh, as Bible-believing Christians, have got a positive message about male and female uh, in today's world, which is not being heard by our culture. Uh, so we, we, will, we will come at that from this perspective today. Now, one of the things I want to share with you is that is why I'm focusing on, first of all, male and female identity. Most theological discussion about male and female focuses on roles. As I said earlier, how many books have you seen or sermons? The role of women in the church. The role of husband and wife. And, and roles are important. Um, very significant. We have to examine the scriptures to learn as much as we can about how God sees the roles of men and women at home, family, church, society, and so on. Ask the question, what are the roles? Are there differing roles? Uh, but I, I was in a, a conference, and there was a big vote at this conference concerning whether women could or should reach the highest level of authority in amongst that group and group of churches. I'm not going to give you the outcome, I'm not going to give you the debate. But what discouraged me was every person that argued for, for a complementarian viewpoint or for an egalitarian viewpoint, we're coming on to this in a moment, it was something that I'd heard on the BBC or something that I heard from secular society. Nobody seemed to be coming at it from God's point of view, apart from quoting scriptures uh, about role. And I thought, what's missing? And it hit me what was missing. Nobody was talking about what does it mean to be a godly man of God? What does it mean to be a godly woman of God? Should we just cut that bit out and just say, a godly person of God. Would we miss something about uh, identity, our identity as men and women? Now, this is not, we, we, we cannot be dominated by society or by stereotypes. What disappointed me was a lot of people who were arguing what they consider to be a biblical point of view were talking about stereotypes, mocking traditional stereotypes of the role of men and women and saying how old-fashioned this was, but they weren't going to the Bible. Now, I don't want to oversell this because in this course, I can only just begin. I want us to go to look at what is, it, what is male identity before God? What is female identity? What is, it, is, is there a difference? And what is that difference? And how does it all work? And we're going to just stop short of, of having looked at the etymology the Hebrew uh, and the Greek, um, we will not be able to do a full study to go through this throughout the whole of the scriptures. But I'm laying a foundation for when we get to Genesis 3, because in Genesis 3, we have, in, in, in my view, we have a spiritual being, not just a snake, a spiritual being, and that spiritual being knows exactly how to attack male identity, and female identity to get the man to fail to do what he should have done and to get the woman to do what she shouldn't have done. And um, so we're going to take it slowly and I'm very open, I'm very open for interaction, very open to questions and throughout this course I guess I'll be dogmatic about some stuff. I guess I will. I mean I'm going to be dogmatic that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, okay? But I'm not going to be dogmatic where there are 
issues where Christians see it differently or where the biblical data requires a lot of careful interpretation. Because I'm, I do not believe that simply because I've done this work now for several years that I, I am the oracle about it. You know what I'm saying? There are real Bible scholars which I draw my work from and I'm continuing my own research. But I'm just throwing some ideas as far as I've got so we can look at this because I think it is significant. This isn't just experimental theology. This is, this is touching on very significant things. The existence of the spiritual realm. How does that interact with us today? What authority do we have in the spiritual realm? How does that reflect on God's overall missional purpose for us as husband, wife, local church people? So it is, it's really targeting towards equipping people with the right kind of thinking of scripture and some tools to take the matter further. So he hence this, and this is probably the first time since that encounter that I had, that disappointing encounter, and I went back home and I asked God, why am I so troubled? What is it? I didn't like any of that debate. What is, not even trying to take sides with one another, I didn't like any of it. it it came across to me, it was like being conducted in, with the wrong spirit, with a kind of um, language that is, that is used through certain social, political pressure groups, um, and, and lip service was being paid to the word of God, but only to find proof texts. And I said, God, help me with this. And I'm, I'm not now saying that what I'm giving you is, is, is therefore this wonderful answer to prayer, but at least we're going down that direction. So, uh, here's simple facts, theological facts. There are two main schools of thought about male and female uh, as created by God. There is one theological school of thought called egalitarianism. There's another called complementarianism. Egalitarianism emphasizes the equality of the sexes. And hey, there's enough of that, isn't there? Male and female, he created them. In his image, he created them. So I've, I don't think very few, well, very few people will want to argue against the, the fact that men and women are equal in dignity and worth before the Lord. But then egalitarians take that further and say, therefore, there is no distinction whatsoever in the roles of men and women in the home, this is the extreme egalitarianism, no distinction whatsoever between men and women and their role in the home, in the family, in the church, and in society. And if we want to say, wait a bit, we've got to make some distinctions, already you are beginning to rub against our cultural norm, cultural consensus, and indeed cultural orthodoxy. Years ago, orthodoxy was a matter of doctrine. Today, it's a matter of culture. You would be excommunicated for false doctrine. Now you're cancelled for going against cultural views. Complementarianism, uh, that's exactly what it sounds like. Men and women are created equal in dignity and worth, but their roles differ in various spheres, especially in the family and the church. Um, and this complementarian role it has nearly always focused on role rather than identity. If you come across any literature that actually discusses what we're discussing today in terms of identity, please pass it on to me. I want us to be in connection and a correspondence. You can email me, we can uh, ask questions, and I will also be giving you links to various things so you can follow up yourself. So that's basically the two theological views. So I've already mentioned this, that uh, I believe we should begin not with roles, roles are important, but begin with identity because your role flows out of your identity. So we've got to ask ourselves, is there an answer to this question? What does the Bible teach about masculinity? So, we could play with this a little bit. Picture some ideas of masculinity. You might picture a man with muscles, you might picture a man uh, like uh, uh, my, my Viking friend who met me at the airport, hair down to his knees, let alone his shoulders. He's part of a, of a Viking evangelistic ministry. He takes baseball bats and 
cracks them in two and makes crosses out of them and preaches the gospel. They smash ice blocks, not ice cubes, but ice blocks with their head. And I mean, he's a real man. Now, I am not a, a, a brick-smashing, stone-smashing person. Uh, I actually have a creative background. Um, but because I understand masculinity, I'm not threatened by a man with more muscles than me. We hit it off so well, didn't we, Amanda? We're, we're great friends. <laughs> it looks, looks ridiculous. I mean, somebody who still walks a little like a duck because of my dance training. And this man, he walks like a truck. But, but you know, there are ranges of how masculinity plays out in some of those ways, but when you get down to the definitive stuff, male is male, and masculine means something, and it starts with identity. Now, because I'm a counsellor, I'd love just to sort of shoot off into this direction. So many people are struggling with identity. Their identity as men, their identity as women. And our, our culture tells us to look within for identity. How do you feel? What, what, what's going on in here? Don't look inside for your identity. That's why we're in a mess. So what is identity? How you see yourself. That's your own personal identity. How you see yourself. But that identity must be the identity that aligns with how God sees you. All of us in counselling, or many of you are involved in ministry, you, you have to help people see themselves as Jesus sees them and as, God's, as God sees them. So this is very, very relevant in today's world. It, it is a huge issue in today's world. And so Larry Crabb, in his book, Fully Alive, and we'll be touching on that material more, uh, says masculinity and femininity are part of our distinctive identity as gendered image bearers. Um, moving on now, we let's see where all this began. You are aware, aren't you, that there are two creation accounts in the book of Genesis. Chapter 1 and chapter 2. There are other almost creation accounts, but give you, give you very much similar material in other parts of the scripture, but these are the two main ones. The first creation account is where we read of the nouns for male and female, zakar and nakaba in the Hebrew. I don't be too impressed, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I know people who are, so there we go. Genesis 1, 26 to 28, we read this in the earlier session, let us make humanity in our image, and then in verse 27, he says, so God created humanity, man, that's the word Adam, which also is a proper name for the first man, Adam, but here, Adam, it means humanity. Let us make the man, let us make Adam, let us make humanity. God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, Adam. Male and female, he created them. So this goes right back to how God made us. That's a theological statement, but we will see how biology totally lines up with theology. Even though people today are messing with biology, but we're not going to mess with it, we're just going to stick to the basics. Then he said, uh, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So let's note straight away that male and female identity is linked to the capacity to multiply. So, physically, this is, we're talking about sex, we're not talking about the act of sex, but we're talking about sex, male or female. Years ago, uh, when a child was born, the, 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 the doctor would they'd ask, what is, what is the sex of your child? Some, on some forms, you still got sex, male or female. Now, we kind of replace that word with gender, but... Let's, let's see what's happening there. So we're talking about sex, and we're talking about the male and female bodies given the, op, the, the potential to reproduce. So God created 
man in his own image, male and female, he created them. Be fruitful and multiply. So male and female, at root level, has something to do with reproduction. Very significant when we start to look at how our society culturally is moving away from the fundamentals of biology. And I suppose we can't criticize them for moving away from the fundamentals of theology because we haven't told them yet. We haven't done enough evangelism, haven't loved them enough to bring them into the knowledge of God through the scriptures. But what is interesting is biology totally lines with theology in this point. So in the first creation account, uh, men and women are God's joint representatives of earth, of, of God on earth. Let them have dominion. This is part of the calling uh, and role and status as images of God. Uh, and so male and female created them. I'll put this down in words which are really just implied anyway. Male and female, how many sexes? do you see there? Male and female. Do you, see, do you see a third? Do you see a hundred? Okay. Two sexes, and I put the word genders in brackets, suggesting that uh, when I'm talking about sex, sex like that, some people use the word gender. And I, it's very hard to get away from the word gender in today's world. But the two sexes, there is a binary biological and theological reality. So you're saying, you, where do you get this in the Bible? Well, he, God made the body, and the body is part of biology. And don't forget, we live life in the body. We are not disembodied beings. The great success of our lives is not to escape the body and live as some kind of spirit in the sky. No. The great success of our lives and the fulfillment of God's purposes is that we'll be resurrected and be, become embodied beings forever, immortal, in our resurrected bodies. God made us embodied beings. We're different from the heavenly beings. They are spirit beings. We are spirit body beings. And the life we live in the body is so important. It's so life-affirming. Uh, Christ, the Christian faith is the most life-affirming religion, if you wish to call it a religion, on this planet. Life, the enjoyment of life in the body. It's, it's, it's of course, to be dominated by the faith of the Son of God indwelling us, but the, the physical life is to be celebrated and enjoyed. And I just did it in between the sessions by eating one of my wife's freshly baked brownies. Thank you, Lord, for that. So, um, somebody might want to say, well, what about intersex? Um, we can talk about that for a bit now, if you want to. Bio biology. We're told that there is male, female, and intersex. Intersex is a biological anomaly, it's not a third sex. Um, and there is a spectrum within the categories of male and female. And that spectrum is to do with secondary sexual characteristics and at certain times biological uh, developmental issues, sexual developmental issues to do with hormones and so forth, where there can be some very small number of people that may present with slightly ambiguous genitalia or, or various other scopes. For example, do you know that fundamentally XX equals male XY equals XX equals <laughs> my wife's female XY equals, right? There are some women that only have one X hormone or chromosome. There's some men that have XXY. The very sh um, small number of people. These are anomalies within the binary. That's not a third sex. To put it bluntly, 
what defines you as a male biologically is the uh, reproductive system in which you as a male produce small gametes called sperm. What a woman does is produce large gametes called ova or ovum. And that is what, well, ova is plural, right, okay. So, so that is what defines you biologically. Never has there been a third category, let alone a, th a fourth and a fifth and a sixth. But intersex does represent some uh, uh, developmental disorders which um, need, to be, need to be addressed. And so, yeah, how, how interesting is that? If you want more on that, uh, we can come back on it. Um, but let's move on f for, for now. Male and female identity in the Bible, still the first creation account. Let's do a little bit of an analysis of that text. Verse 28, and God blessed them. So this mandate, the um, creation mandate to be fruitful and multiply, um, b begins with a, a blessing. And it's a relational blessing. God blessed them. Who? The male and the female. So, if you're a man, you're not more blessed than a number person near you, opposite you, or even maybe married you, who's a woman. You're not more blessed than she. She's not more blessed than you. And you're not just blessed individually. You're blessed in a male-female connection. And that connection finds its supreme and ultimate expression in marriage and in reproduction within marriage. But you don't suddenly leave your maleness behind when you go to work. It's not just something that is to do with a sexual relationship. God has given you a male identity. God has given you a female identity. And male identity and the fe <coughs> female identity are equally blessed by God. Equally blessed. And then it says, and God said to them, excuse me. <coughs> and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. I've just uh, underlined on the screen for you that this is God's spoken word. And it is as authoritative as every other spoken word of God, as authoritative as it says when God said, let there be light and there was light. So this is immutable. God's unchangeable, authoritative, creative word. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So procreation is at the heart of the creation mandate and it is fundamental to the male-female distinction. Fundamental. Because if you go to a biologist, not somebody who is a pseudoscientist, who is actually bringing ideology into their uh, um, scientific papers or scientific articles, what is a woman? adult female. What defines a male biologically is to do with the male reproductive system producing small gametes and for the woman producing large gametes which are all to do with reproduction. So that's so important to realize that this is to do with reproduction. For when, when you come on to talk about the legitimacy of marriage and the importance of marriage, remember that. That's fundamental to the biblical revelation. Uh, fill the earth and subdue it. It's a kingdom mandate. Have dominion. We saw that was particularly over the natural world. Um, so key points from the first creation account. The human race exists in one genus, one kind, with two 
morphologies. Uh, the technical term is diamorphic. Diamorphic. Uh, a, a word which is attacked very much in our culture is binary. Binary. And if you uh, are a non-binary person, you are in some way denying or moving away in your identity from biological reality. And this human race exists in two forms. Male, represented by the Hebrew word zakar. We'll come to the Greek in a moment. And nekaba. So we can say both equally carry God's image and are both equal in dignity and worth. That's an identity word. Both have equal to part to play in the creation mandate. mandate and they bring their distinctiveness into the partnership. Identity is male and female, precedes role and, and or function. God created them with an identity. He blessed them and he commanded them and empowered them. It all goes back to identity. So relationship is fundamental to the creation of, him, of humanity um, and the pinnacle of male-female relationship before God, uh, intimate relationship is marriage, um, and then that's the fundamental basis of family and community. That's a sociological fact, but it also is a biblical fact. And so the creation mandate begins with and continues only with God's blessing. Moving into the second creation account, that's Genesis chapter 2. This adds some key perspectives. It comes at the same teaching but gives a bit more information and here there is a lot of teaching concerning identity and indeed roles of men and women. Genesis 2.18, then the Lord said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper, fit for, corresponding to him. And the Hebrew word for man is ish, the Hebrew word for woman is isha. So, let's look at ish and isha. What's interesting to me is I read this, um, then the man said this, this is Genesis 2.23, then the man said this at last, at last, that's a very, very poignant expression. What's the background to that? God said he created Adam first. Adam is naming all the animals. And he's looking amongst these animals to see if he can find a best friend. And not even the dog did that. <laughs> because when he saw a woman, he said this at last is the companion for me. And this shows that God, in creating Adam and not being good for the man to be alone, he created within him something that required to be complemented by another human being of a, 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 a woman. A woman. Not just any other human being, but a woman. His wife. At last this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh and she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. And then a foundational text. Therefore, because male and female were created by God, created by God, given a mandate which, was, which included reproducing, filling the earth, multiplying and having dominion, then the coming together of male and female in marriage, that's, an, that's, a, that's a specific relationship. Men can have friends who are women. It doesn't have to be sexual, and it should not be sexual outside of marriage. So I'm not saying you can't have, a, if you're a guy, you can't have a great female friend who's, you know, a really good mate of yours and so forth. No, no, all this is to be encouraged. Uh, people who are of the same sex have healthy relationships and participatory relationships and some of this can be very very deep such as David and Jonathan but the line is it's not to be sexual 
because the sexual nature and function was given for reproduction of through male and female. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That is, Genesis 2.24 is repeated several times in the scripture without any change all the way through. This was God's original, current, and evermore plan on this earth for human sexuality and human relationships. So, at last, no suitable helper for Adam had been found among the animals. Eve was formed from Adam's side, and she's taken out of the man, therefore called woman, and it's a play on words because isha sounds like the Hebrew word for man, ish. So let's dig a little deep. This is the where to begin. What does it mean to be a, a, a male, a man, a masculine man, to be masculine? I shouldn't have to use all those words, but because we're all talking about the same thing. What does it mean? What does it mean for me or for you to be a godly man or a godly woman? A spirit-filled, godly, male, man. What does it mean? We start with the meaning of the words for male and female. Male is akar, female nakaba. And in Greek, the word is ar, um, arsene and thule. Thelus, rather, male and female in the Greek. Um, okay. But these words point to the fundamental identity. They can only point there. You need a great deal more than trying to analyze a Greek and Hebrew word to find out who you are. <laughs> you need a lot more than that. But it's a starting point. Biblical words for male and female. Zakah occurs 80 times in the Old Testament indicating a male, the male sex of, actually is used of, uh, for both men and animals in, in, in the scriptures. The etymology of zakah is obscure. And I know it from the best, you just look at my references. It's obscure. Um, now, the best scholarly answer to that is the root has something to do with being sharp, pointed, and the best understanding of nekava means to be bore, bore, to bore or to pierce. Clearly a reference to male and female genitalia. Now, I, I, I mentioned that at a men's meeting not so very long ago, and they were shocked that I'd even mention the shape of male and female genitalia in a Christian meeting. Well, it was an all-male meeting, and I probably would have said it was male and female together anyway, because God made our bodies. And part of the problem why much of our society is kind of exploring, it's doing its own thing, is because we have not been as ready as we should be to teach on the physicality of who we are. God invented this. He designed it. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And it's only because people who speak about male and female genitalia in various contexts are doing it crudely, um, with lustful, uh, negative overtones, but there is something so utterly, amazingly pure about our physical bodies. It is what we choose to do with that, where the impurity comes. Um, now, here is something I want to spend time on, because I'm recommending to you 
um, this book, uh, which is uh, fully alive. This, the, the, book, the title of the book is, is Fully Alive. And um, the author takes this connection with the root zakar and this meaning to remember and we'll, I'll, I'll take you through that as we go. But here's, I've kept all this in, I've shown you my workings. You know, have, you ever, have you ever gone to a science test or something, or a, a math test, and you have the answer, they said, let me, look, let me look at your workings. How did you get there? And the difference between this kind of teaching, what I normally do is I'm showing you the workings. And the reason for that is this. You would think, if you're going to do advanced biblical study, just open a few more concordances, look up a few more references, study the Hebrew and the Greek, go to an encyclopedia, and hey, it's going to get clearer and clearer. Often it does. But there comes a time when you are going to see that there is questions about some basic things, and you're going to have in a mature way to do your own research and to come up with your conclusions, rather than just to say, this is what it means. And pastors and preachers do this. This in the Greek means this. And I sit and listen. I say, no, it does not. It doesn't mean that at all. But don't be discouraged because we have tools, language tools, uh, on, on the internet. And, and you, you can dig quite deeply into the original languages without actually understanding them yourself because there are um, uh, interlinear Bibles and transliterational tools. So you, you can dig at this. So let me just summarize it. I've, I've made the references to the uh, dictionary that I'm referring to. Here's the thing. Zakar comes from a root. Most Hebrew words have, have three letters as a root, Z-K-R, and the vowels come into it as well later. So there is a word, Zakar, which, is, which doesn't mean male, but means memory. It's all the way through. A memorial offering. Zakar. And there is a role in ancient Near Eastern uh, courts of a zakar being an office holder who had a special role to remind the king of what he should be doing. What appointments he has. It's a bit like an executive assistant. And when I had an executive assistant, in the good old days, my executive assistant, and my former executive assistant is here today, um, that former executive assistant would remind me of what, I, what my diary, what day it was, actually, sometimes. Uh, now, apparently, scholarly opinion is that's a nice idea that male means carries with it the understanding of a person who is able to remember and lay hold of important things. It's a great idea, it makes great preaching, and I've kept it in as insofar as to say, let's not put too much store by it, okay? And you'll see this as we go through. So here it is. <clears throat> this is the word which means to recall information or events. Um, and here we have it in um, another uh, Hebrew reference book. So according to Strong, this is um, a reference book, moving into the, he into the Greek, here we have, we've moved from Hebrew, you can tell by the shape, shape of the letters, that's the kind of thing you see in Greece, with other letters, the kind of thing you might see in Israel. But here we are in Greece. You could see this. Arsene is the word, Greek word for male. And of course, you know the New Testament was written in Greek, the Old Testament mainly in Hebrew. And Thelus for female. Now, Arsene, according to Strong, means male as in terms as of stronger Stronger for lifting, physical strength. We know 
that pound by pound, male bodies are stronger than female bodies in terms of muscle power. Now, you can prove me wrong. I'm sure you could find a woman who could beat me at arm wrestling and who would, would, would you know, overpower me. But it, basically, this is what it means in the New Testament, the, the woman is the weaker vessel. It's talking about physical frame. So it's interesting how this goes right back to the derivation. So it sets the tone for a broader attribution of a certain kind of strength which is linked to the male identity. We'll come to that as we go through. Uh, th the derivation for the female, Thelus, is linked to the breast. And it has the image of a breastfeeding mother at the root of the word. Now, let me tell you something that's very important to learn. You don't learn everything you need to learn by looking at the root of something or its derivation. Be careful. Let me give you an illustration. Any Italians here? Okay, what is the word for liver in Italian? Fegato. I'm glad you said it, not me, because I would say fegato or something. Fegato. You look at that word by derivation. What does it sound like? Figato. What does it sound like? By derivation, it's linked to the word for fig. What is my liver got to do with figs? Oh, the ancient Romans ate their liver and delighted to fill it with fruit, especially figs. So it tells you how that word came into currency. <laughs> I can just imagine a preacher saying, I am speaking to you about liver, and in the Italian, it means stuffed with figs. <laughs> Therefore, God wants you to know. No, he doesn't want you to know nothing about that, just to learn how to do uh, etymology and derivation. So, you, and another slightly more sensible and serious example, let's take the word ecclesia. Ecclesia, made from two words, ek meaning out of, klesis meaning calling, called out ones. So I've heard many preachers say this is the meaning of the word church, those who are called out. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. It's not about being called out. That's just part of the picture. It's about assembling. It's called out for the purpose of assembling. The correct translation is assembly. Right? So be careful about derivation, etymology, but we are going uh, slowly here. So this at the very least, begins to set the tone for the male and female identity. And then that's it. Have I gone into lecture six already? Yes. Oh, you should have told me. Oh, what I've done is I've rushed ahead. Anyway, that's not a problem because we've still got quite a lot to cover. So um, let, us, um, let us pause now. Um, we have uh, two minutes, if we want to stick to our schedule, because after this you've got a 20-minute break. Two minutes. Please, somebody ask me the first question. Thank you for the first question. Now let's go to the second question. Yes? You, you can ask me anything at, th at this point. I don't mind. <laughs> Yes. Um, is that why Jehovah's Witnesses uh, maintain that Jesus is like a son of God in the idea of being a spiritual being rather than being Okay, so the question is to repeat it for our audience at home is does the Jehovah's Witness teaching that Jesus is a son of God, an angel? rather than the divine, unique Son of God. Has it got something to do with this? I want to answer that question, no. Because if it was something to do with this, they would see that Jesus is the unique Son of God, an image bearer. 
But sometimes people, both Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, will use some of this divine language of, of angels for their own doctrinal purposes. Even when we go to people who are following New Age ideas, uh, when we have in um, Psalm 82 and John chapter 7, the quotation, does not your own law say you are gods? And the you are gods teaching has filtered into New Age teaching where we become divine. Certainly that is how Mormons take it. Um, so what is good about what we're doing is we are trying to look at the scriptures in context, especially in the ancient Near Eastern context, so that we will rightly understand these things. And you will be far better equipped to have a discussion with the Jehovah's Witness and a discussion with uh, a Mormon or even a New Age person because you know what the Bible says. Well, I hope you do, and I hope you will, and go on and master this, this, this teaching. Um, and very often, um, without being offensive to any Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses who might be watching this, we use the word cult. It is not orthodox biblical teaching. So let's drop the word cult and just use the word unorthodox, heterodox teaching, which is false teaching. That's probably just as offensive, but I'm here to tell you what the, the Bible says. Now, where some of these groups gain traction is through the ignorance of people in the church. So because very largely evangelical teachers, theologians, even Bible translators and commentators kind of ignore the supernatural realm and the supernatural context of some basic fundamental stories such as Genesis 3, the fall, Genesis 6, the flood, Genesis 11, Babel. All of these things are richly endued with spiritual beings and an understanding of those spiritual beings will give us a, a lot to go on. And when we come to Psalm 82, where the statement says, you are gods, who is he talking to? Who is he talking about? If he's talking about these angelic beings who we call the sons of God or the multiple lesser Elohim, we haven't got a problem, have we? Because we've, we'll understand it. If he's talking about Jewish leaders, then we've got a lot of work to do. And sometimes people will go to the natural explanation, certainly in Genesis 6, when the angels, the sons of God, went into the daughters of man. They certainly want to go down a natural explanation for that because the supernatural explanation is too bizarre and there's a lot of kind of wrong kind of rationalism in our minds because we have not yet fully mastered the biblical worldview of just how supernatural the Bible's worldview is. And then also uh, in the whole area of Genesis 11, which is the story of Babel, which is commented on in Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9 in particular. So when we get to those, it will become clear. Now, I gave you a whole lot more, which I'm sure you were looking for, but did that at least touch on, on what you had to ask? Thank you. Let's take our break now. We'll see you back in 20 minutes. And hey, guys, stick with us. We're going to be back.